Good afternoon. Uh, so I'll be talking about some biomarkers in our inflammation. Um, I will talk about some uh, the technologies that are current that we have currently to measure cytokine levels and also gene expression assays. And specifically, I'll talk a little bit about uh, biomarkers to evaluate the presence of interferon uh, response gene signature or interferon response uh, signature. So briefly, um, I, I put this slide here uh, to differentiate the immune deficiencies to, uh, uh, from the auto-inflammatory diseases. The auto-inflammatory diseases are characterized by, usually by early onset of um, uh, rashes, fevers, and or, or other organ manifestations. And the, the inflammation is sterile. There is no microorganism involved. And differently from many of the PIDs, they don't have susceptibility to infections. This slide is very busy, but it's just to have an idea that nowadays there are more than 50 uh, autoinflammatory genes associated with an autoinflammatory diseases, and then uh, they can be caused by defects in molecules involved in the innate immune response. For example, gain-of-function mutations in the inflammasomes, the NLP3, the pyre inflammasome, the NLC4 inflammasome, uh, cause an autoinflammatory disease. And these are IL-1-mediated disease, but uh, the NLC4 also has a component of IL-18. Uh, mutations in intracellular sensors of nucleic acids also cause another inflammatory disease, such as gain of function mutation in Shin causing SAVI, and the uh, variants associated with Icardi Gutierrez syndrome and dysfunction in the protosome system they, system, they all cause type 1 interferonopathies. Uh, there are also the NF-kappa B mediated diseases and the IL-18 mediated diseases, which also have the component of IL-1. Scott talked this morning with you uh, about IL-18 mediated dis diseases, and I won't talk about NF-kappa B. Sergio gave also a good, uh, nice essay that can be used to evaluate that. I will focus on the IL-1 and type 1 interferonopathy especially. So, uh, as you all know, the, uh, main, I will just uh, very briefly say which ones are the I one most pre prevalent uh, I one mediated autoinflammatory diseases, which are the cryopyrin associated autoinflammatory diseases caused by gain of function in our in inflammasome, and uh, deficiency of I one receptor antagonists or GIRA. DIRA. And then gain of function mutations in the pyrin inflammasome cause nowadays uh, uh, more um, expanded phenotype, extended phenotype, not only familiar Mediterranean fever, but also some neutrophilic uh, dermatosis syndrome. And the other IOMJated diseases are deficiency of mevalonate kinase and traps. In regards to the interferonopathies, uh, here at the NIH, we follow patients uh, with um, SAVI, shing associated with vasculopathy with onset in infancy, and with uh, candle or proteasome associated autoinflammatory syndromes. They both are associated with very uh, strong interferon response uh, signature, which I will discuss uh, briefly as well. So, in regards to the technique, in regards to the techniques, uh, first I will go through the uh, cytokine measurement assays. So, the most uh, the, the, uh, an assay that, that is used uh, very frequently, but more often in the past, um, it has been how can I say replaced by other multiplex assays, which I also briefly discuss. So ELISA um, is characterized by the presence of, a, first, the plate is coated by a specific um, antibody. And then you include your sample, which could be serum or a plasma, or the body fluids like BAL or CSF, um, or supernatant from cells stimulated, for example. And then the most commonly used is the sandwich ELISA or capture ELISA. This is the capture antibody, which is here. And then there is another antibody uh, uh, bound to an enzyme. And then when you add the substrate, this enzyme will break it and it will generate the color and tell you the concentration based on the optic density. 
So uh, it's difficult to find actually now papers showing ELISA uh, uh, measuring uh, biomarkers in autoinflammatory diseases. But uh, recently, uh, Dr. Kaplan's, Mariana Kaplan's group uh, showed that in Papa syndrome, these patients have high serum levels of IL-1 beta, which classically is known as difficult, being very difficult to measure actually in serum, uh, high levels of uh, TNF alpha, although not significantly, but significantly higher levels of IOH and interferon gamma in comparison with the healthy controls. IO6 was also higher, but not significantly higher. In regards to the multiplex uh, immunoassays, they are also called uh, more commonly like Luminex, um, uh, Bioplex or multiplex um, ELISA, some people call too, but most, more often we, we hear uh, Luminex uh, as a name. But although there are other companies that uh, uh, provide that now. So uh, this is a bead, a uh, magnetic bead, bead assay. So there is a bead and the capture antibody will be uh, attached to the beads, the magnetic beads. And then when you add your samples, which they that is specifically on a light that you want to, to measure, for example, IL-1, IL-6, TNF, alpha, um, will bind to the specific antibody, and then you add the second antibody, um, which is also specific to that on a light, and then a reported dye. The measurement is uh, through uh, fluorescent sorting, so each one, uh, each one of the multiplex um, Sometimes it's up to 150 analytes. Uh, each one will have a color, and then by that, you know the concentration of the specific analyte. In terms of the use of the Luminex uh, or multiplex immunizers, it's been very uh, much used, very often used in the auto, uh, autoimmune and autoinflammatory disease, not, not a lot, of publications in monogenic autoinflammatory diseases. So I included here a very nice uh, paper from Dr. Fowles' group uh, of systemic GI. It's a biomarker uh, paper. So the first strategy of this uh, study was uh, using proteomics, which I won't get into proteomics, but it's something that it, it's, it should be considered in, um, yeah, in the very near future. But the first assessment was through proteomic, but proteomics, but for validation of the um, differentially expressed uh, analytes, uh, they did Luminex assay as well. Uh, this assay had 150 um, analytes on 150 targets or cytokines or proteins, uh, whatever, uh, however you want to call. And there was a discovery cohort first and a verification cohort. For two of the analytes, actually, uh, because sometimes uh, one of the one or two or three of the analytes, you, they cannot, uh, there are no good antibodies for uh, Luminex. So in, in this case, two of the very good, a very, uh, very much significantly upregulated in the patients with systemic GIA. There are no antibodies, so they use ELISA, actually. I just wanted to point that out because it's not too, very common to see. But this was S112, which Massimo most likely also mentioned about all the proteins that also are biomarkers in the um, autoinflammatory diseases. Yeah, so these are the mostly uh, upregulated uh, cytokines in the discovery cohort and in the verification cohort. But it's important to remember, to, to note, is that in this case here, um, most of the cytokines, they are not specifically, uh, of course, upregulated in one disease or not inflammatory disease or the other. In this case, it's very relevant because it's comparing patients with one phenotype of SGIA in comparison with the other phenotype. So, for example, patients with SGIA had significantly higher levels of IL-6, IL-18, which is called, for sure showed you also this morning. And then in the verification cohort, besides IL-6 and IL-18, uh, they've also shown higher levels of IL-1-alpha and uh, IL-1-receptor antagonists. 
because it's also known that uh, systemic J uh, is often responsive to uh, anti IL-1 therapies. So um, yeah, we can uh, focus more on the IL-1 uh, associated cytokines. Uh, in our group, we also use Luminex. Uh, we have used Luminex for um, detection of uh, 48 cytokines. There is a 21 plus 27 multiplex, uh, plaque that are called plaques. So we combine both, and then you have 48 cytokines. The only thing is that it should never be perfect. I mean, you should never have everything that you want to see, but it's very uh, comprehensive. It can be very useful. In this case here, we performed Luminex in 66 patients with undifferentiated auto-inflammatory diseases. And then after we, first, we, we verified the, which ones of the 66 had, had an interference signature and which ones did not have. And then based on that, we, we checked uh, what was the difference of the cytokine levels between the two groups. And then we observed that these patients with, who have high interference signature, they have higher levels of IP10, which is a CXL10, or interferon gamma-inducible chemokine. It's also induced by all the interference, but the name became like interferon gamma-inducible chemokine, or CXL10. They also have significantly higher levels of grow alpha, uh, CXCL9, which is also, can also be a biomarker for uh, macrophage activation syndrome. Um, TRAIL, uh, SCF, and interestingly, they had significantly they had significantly lower levels of RANTs in comparison with both healthy controls and non patients with, who did not have an interferon uh, response signature. So we, uh, we put this heat map together based on the 48 cytokines here. And then we just clustered the, cy the cytokines based on the uh, study from Scott and us uh, in 2014 that showed they, um, that described uh, along with another group, together with another group, um, gain of function mutations in RC4 causing recurrent macrophage activation syndrome. And Scott noticed that these 12 cytokines here, they are extremely upregulated. One of them, of course, is IL-18, uh, upregulating these patients. And then we wanted to see uh, if we could, if we also observed patients who had a signature of 12 cytokines. And we had, uh, <clears throat> we had uh, seven patients uh, who have recurrent macrophage activation syndrome and uh, pulmonary alveolar protein noses, uh, who is called also uh, um, studies, uh, studies them with us as well, um, and, and helps us a lot with the IL-18 measurement. So these patients, they have a, a very similar signature of the patients with NLRC4 MAS. <clears throat> In contrast with the patients who do not have an interference signature. But this group, I won't get into details because although they have, they can have an interferon response signature, uh, the IO chain component is much more significant. In regards to gene expression, I say, uh, what I, I, I like to say, to think, is that it's an a increasing, um, how can I say, increasing number of targets that you can detect with these methods here progressively. So for example, with real-time quantitative, quantitative PCR, uh, usually is used for detection of a, a couple of genes, for example, six, 10 genes um, on average, but it's a very specific test that is used sometimes for, not sometimes, very, frequently to validate the findings that you had from other gene expression methods. Nanostring, uh, we have been using nanostring as a gene expression assay for, uh, I think, for six years, six years now. And uh, in this method, it's not, you can have panels uh, that are provided, and these, these panels can have up to 800 genes, and you can also customize panels. And RNA-seq, it's actually the whole transcriptome. So it's like a whole 
yeah, whole exome, but in this case, you have the whole transcriptome sequencing. You have an idea of the expression of all genes. So very briefly, uh, real-time qPCR is a method in which uh, the first step of the real-time PCR is to do a reverse transcription. So you need to use an enzyme with the RNA. You start with the RNA, and you do a reverse transcription with a, a reverse transcriptase. And then a polymerase chain reaction. And then after that, an dye. This is read in a, a machine. There are several uh, equip, um, in an instrument. <laughs> there are several, um, how can I say, manufacturers now. And uh, for gene expression, usually we uh, evaluate the uh, CT uh, levels. And the higher the numbers of cycles, the higher the number of cycles, the lower the expression. So, Yanni um, uh, Crow, um, he started, uh, he created for the first time the interferon score. <clears throat> the interferon score uh, using this panel, this uh, group of genes, the six, six interferon response genes. His score is very, uh, is used for main, by many uh, rheumatology and monology services to evaluate the interferon response signature. The score is measured by uh, qPCR. So basically, uh, you do qPCR of the targets that you want to evaluate, and then you perform a, you calculate a score based on the mean and standard deviations of the healthy controls that you have. And um, here are all the examples of the use of qPCR. Uh, in this case here, it's healthy controls PBMC. Um, with different concentrations of the proteasome inhibitor epoxamycin. So in this case, we are mimicking a uh, candle um, opera syndrome. And then you can see, we can see uh, significantly increasing levels of uh, uh, the interferon genes themselves, not uh, interferon response gene, and also uh, increasing higher levels of MX1, one of the interferon response genes, and these are the cytokines also that are measured at that point. And in this case here is actually um, uh, supernatant of patients' PBMC. Uh, in regards to RNA-seq, I won't go long, I'll just uh, briefly touch on that. Um, uh, there are nowadays several platforms, and as you, uh, I'm sure you heard about single cell RNA seq. Now we call when you say RNA sequence seq. Uh, if you don't say single cell, we are referring mostly to the bulk RNA seq, or that we call bulk RNA seq. But there are several common steps within the platforms. Uh, one of them is the mRNA isolation, depletion of the ribosomal RNA. And then uh, you have to fragment the, uh, the RNA and um, do a reverse transcription as well, the same thing that you do with the qPCR. And uh, some important points that uh, should be remembered for the RNA-seq, uh, that's the quality of the sample. Uh, ideally, it has to be above seven of integrity number for the RNA, but the cores and company, they can work on uh, actually very much lower ring numbers. And in regards to the quantity of RNA, it should depend on the platform that you use. If it's low input RNA-seq or normal, yeah, regular input RNA-seq, but it can be down to 10 nanograms. If it's low input RNA-seq, if it's regular, um, you can use one microgram, for example. Uh, here are just two examples from um, our lab showing by RNA-seq, you can also see the interferon response gene signature. Uh, very much higher expression of some interfer gene expression of some interferon response genes in comparison with healthy controls and non-mid. And in this case here, uh, we are checking the um, gene expression of lung endothelial cell lines stimulated with the uh, gene um, uh, ligand CGAM or not, and with both interferon and CGAM. So you see an increasing upregulation of some genes here, and the genes are closer by expression levels in, in this heat map. 
So it's very common to do this type of analysis when uh, you do RNA-seq. You just uh, collect which gene, which are those genes here in this list uh, to, evolve, to check which uh, pathways do this group of genes enrich. And then uh, nanostring. It's the last one that I'm going to talk, although it's in the middle, middle of the spectrum because it says it's not the whole transcriptome. But what you do in the lab is the element system because it's a customized panel. It's not a, a, a ready-made gene expression panel. Uh, in this case, we have to obtain the probes from another company. Uh, they are specific probes for our target. And there are two tags, a reported tag with the color that will be uh, detected by the digital analyzer and the universal, very non-specific capture tag. So nanostring, after you... Um, how can I say? After you design uh, your panel and the pro uh, uh, you order the probes, it becomes very simple and, and the reproducibility is very good uh, as well. So uh, basically the first step is hybridization of the RNA. There is no PCR involved or amplification. And then uh, you put the sample, the RNA sample together with the probes and the uh, tags, report and capture track. They are all uh, in the same, uh, together in the same well, and then you transfer to a cartridge, and then it should be counted the number of uh, uh, RNA, actually, uh, molecules based on the barcodes. In our case, uh, the same 66 patients that I showed you, uh, that uh, we observed that uh, 36 of these 66 had an interferon response gene signature, and the other 27 didn't. Have. Yeah, it's correct. It's because one of them we didn't have interference score. Uh, so it's 66, 65 with interference score, and 36 with high, and the others with low. And then uh, I just want to show that because of the usefulness of the interference score sometimes. Because, for example, some groups of patients, they have a, a high interference score, but not as high a as the type 1 interferon, monogenic interferonopathy, candle, and salve. So we ended up finding that these patients have other uh, diseases, such as nemo uh, or inflammatory disease that we showed to you this morning as well. And I think the ratio, the ratio I can skip. I will just show you the response. Also, the other, uh, uh, other uh, usefulness of the interferon score is to check response to treatment. So uh, in patients with candle, for example, you can see that the paniculitis here improved a lot. And the interference score also, this is candle, the candle group. Uh, it, it also decreased significantly in most of the patients. And the same for the IP10 serum levels. So in summary, um, for IL-1 mediated disease, unfortunately, there are no specific uh, biomarkers. Uh, so except for uh, IL-18 for the IL-18 opathies, uh, actually, but for the because the IL-18 opathies can also respond to IL-1 inhibit inhibition. But for IL-1 mediated disease, the ones that I talked about, CABs, TRAPs, uh, MKG, NGRA, and et cetera, there are no specific markers. So, but um, I think the multiplex assays and the proteomic study can be useful to, uh, to, uh, to try to understand better or to try to find actually a biomarker for these diseases. On the other hand, for the type 1 interferon mediated diseases, the interferon signature is a useful biomarker, uh, not only for clinical evaluation, but also for response to, uh, to treatment. So uh, that's all. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody from uh, our lab, actually, <laughs> and Scott. Thank you very much.